Hi, I'm Dr. Koratala from Medical College of Wisconsin, USA. In this video, I'll give a brief overview of how to assess organ congestion or venous congestion using uh, Doppler ultrasound. It is called VEXUS or the Venous Excess Ultrasound Grading System. I do not have any disclosures. Organ perfusion pressure is the difference between inflow pressure and outflow pressure. For example, in kidney, it's the difference between mean arterial pressure and central venous pressure or intra-abdominal pressure when it's elevated. Also, you can view central venous pressure as organ afterload. But in general, when we are assessing hemodynamics at the bedside, we pay more attention to forward flow. You want to make sure the stroke volume is adequate and the patient is um, volume responsiveness and so on. But uh, we typically do not uh, assess organ congestion. But we do know that organs suffer from uh, venous congestion. Um, for example, in lungs, it can manifest as impaired oxygenation, in the heart as conduction abnormalities and contractility issues, uh, acute kidney injury, altered mental status from uh, cerebrovascular congestion, ileus and malabsorption uh, in the gut, impaired synthetic function in the liver and cholestasis. Um, in the skin, uh, it may manifest as pressure ulcers and so on. Um, so what VEXUS or the venous excess ultrasound grading system lets us do is um, to, it allows us to quantify organ congestion or venous congestion. Um, it involves performing hepatic vein, portal vein and intrarenal venous Doppler in addition to inferior vena cable ultrasound which generally allows us to estimate the right atrial pressure. So this is the landmark paper um, in cardiac surgery patients which showed that in patients who had a dilated IVC that is more than or equal to 2 centimeters in diameter, um, if there are flow abnormalities in at least two of these mentioned veins, those patients' chance of having AKI was significantly elevated. The hazard ratio for AKI was about 3.7 in this study. You can ask, um, I mean, um, ele elevated central venous pressure itself is bad, so why should we add these Doppler studies? So they looked at that too. So they compared CVP of more than or equal to 12 millimeters mercury and the combined VEXUS grading system. So when they included multiple Doppler patterns, the probability of having AKI with the positive test was significantly high compared to when they used CVP alone. So basically VEXUS allows us to quantify the organ congestion and its severity better. So let's briefly talk about the individual components of VEXUS. The first one is hepatic vein. To find the hepatic vein, you go to the lateral aspect, place the probe in the mid-axillary line um, uh, with the probe marker pointing towards the sternal notch and look slightly posteriorly. Most likely in that place, you will find a straight segment of the hepatic vein. And uh, most of the time it's blue in color. I mean, if it's normal, because uh, most of the blood flow is away from the probe or towards the heart. And similarly, when you do a pulsed wave Doppler tracing of the hepatic vein, most of the waveform is below the baseline because below the baseline in spectral Doppler is analogous to blue color on the color Doppler. And most of the times with slight probe manipulation, you will be able to find both hepatic and portal veins in the same window. And in, in some patients with good windows, you can find everything, inferior vena cava, hepatic vein and portal vein um, in the same image. So let's quickly look at um, how hepatic vein uh, waveform appears in, in normal condition and also how it changes with increasing right atrial pressure. Um, and as we already uh, talked about, red color is above the baseline tracing and blue color is below the baseline tracing when it comes to spectral Doppler. And hepatic vein waveform has these distinct waves A, S, V and D. It's pretty similar to um, jugular venous uh, uh, tracing, actually. So let's see these individual waveforms. First, S wave. S wave is a systolic wave. It occurs during ventricular systole. So if you look at this figure, during ventricular systole, the tricuspid annulus moves towards the apex, making more room in the right atrium. So more blood goes into the right atrium, which is the S wave. And towards the end of the systole, the tricuspid annulus comes back raising the pressure in the right atrium. So that manifests as the 
a positive deflection or the V wave. And this V wave can be above the baseline or below the baseline. And during diastole, what happens? The tricuspid valve opens. So the pressure in the right atrium falls again and there is more blood going into the right atrium. Now you see a D wave or diastolic wave. Uh, the normal in the normal hepatic vein waveform s is more than d the amplitude of the s wave is bigger than that of d and towards end diastole um, you have a, another small uh, positive deflection which is called the a wave a wave is because of atrial contraction so when there is increased uh, pressure in the right atrium uh, because of the atrial contraction you have uh, there is backward flow of the blood giving rise to a wave so what happens to this hepatic vein waveform as the right atrial pressure increases? So normally S is more than D. And as the right atrial pressure increases, there is more resistance to the blood flow during systole. You can imagine this situation better if you think of tricuspid regurgitation. And indeed, most of the times when there is volume overloaded, there is some degree of tricuspid regurgitation. So what happens in regurgitation when uh, during systole, the jet is going into the right atrium raising the pressure inside right atrium or in other in other words it's offering resistance to the s wave so the amplitude of the s wave becomes smaller and smaller as the right atrial pressure increases so here you can see the s wave is completely above the baseline and as the right atrial pressure increases further there will be just one waveform above the baseline and one waveform below the baseline so below the baseline waveform will be the d wave or diastolic wave in other words blood is flowing towards the heart only during diastole that's why this is also called d only pattern or severe congestion and this is the ekg um, and central venous uh, waveform correlation with the hepatic vein so generally mechanical activity follows electrical activity so s wave occurs after the qrs complex and d wave occurs after the t wave in the ekg and uh, if you look at the cvp S wave and D wave of hepatic vein are analogous to X descent and Y descent of the CVP. And whenever possible, it's always uh, good to have EKG tracing along with hepatic vein. It helps a lot when a patient is uh, having arrhythmias and you have irregular waveforms and you have difficulty identifying waveforms. Um, for example, in this left side image, you are seeing a patient with atrial fibrillation and irregular cardiac cycles. And on the right hand side, like without EKG, it just appears like D only pattern or it might be confused with severe congestion. But with EKG, you can see that there is fusion of S and D waves because it's, it's starting before the QRS complex. This is the D wave of one cycle and here is the S wave of the next cycle. And it typically happens in hyperdynamic hearts. So EKG helps. And the next waveform is the portal vein waveform. As opposed to hepatic vein, which is a direct tributary of um, inferior vena cava, portal vein is shielded off from uh, the direct pressure of the uh, right atrium by hepatic sinusoids. So you can say hepatic sinusoids act as um, uh, resistance or barriers to uh, pressure transmission. And this is this old study published in 1987, uh, which they looked at what is the percentage of uh, CVP that is transmitted to hepatic sinusoids. It's never really linear. It, it always um, um, it transmitted in a non-linear uh, fashion. It's, it's usually not never 100% transmission unless in very severe elevation of right atrial pressure. So normal portal vein appears red in color because the flow is towards the transducer or into the heart. The portal vein collects the blood from the abdominal organs and goes into the liver. And that means the tracing should be above the baseline. And because this is a, the uh, uh, exact CVP is not transmitted to portal vein, it's it's um, it's more a continuous pattern rather than exhibiting um, individual waveforms. And with increasing right atrial pressure, it becomes more and more pulsatile. So initially, it's continuous with slight elevations in right atrial pressure. The pulsatility increases. So normal pulsatility is less than 30%. It's acceptable up to 30%. And when the pulsatility is between um, um, 30 and 50, you call it mild congestion. Um, and if it's more than 50% uh, pulsatility, you call it significant or severe congestion. So here you can see there is 50% or more than 50% pulsatility 
And here you have actually 100% pulsatility and also flow reversal during late systole. This waveform typically happens when there is severe tricuspid regurgitation um, accompanying the elevated right atrial pressure. And pulsatile portal waveform can be occasionally seen uh, even without elevated right atrial pressure, especially in patients with uh, uh, liver cirrhosis, uh, most likely because of portal hypertension. And uh, it, it can also occur in uh, young and uh, thin um, individuals. So everything needs to be interpreted in the right uh, clinical context and not in isolation. Last component of excess is the intrarenal vein. That is the blood vessels within the renal parenchyma. Doing Doppler of them will tell you exactly how the kidney is feeling the congestion. And remember kidney is an encapsulated space and venous congestion which leads to interstitial edema can lead to what is called as renal tamponade. And uh, to do the renal Doppler you get a good image of the uh, grayscale image of the kidney then turn on the uh, color Doppler and if the color doesn't pick up you can also use power Doppler so that it picks up uh, uh, low flows. And then you put your pulsed wave Doppler sample volume on the interlobar vessels uh, that is beside the medullary pyramids and you get a tracing. The renal venous waveform pattern is very continuous. It's essentially very similar to that of portal vein um, but it's below the baseline because in renal vein the blood is flowing away from the transducer when you are looking at the kidney uh, from the lateral aspect. And most of the time it is accompanied by arterial tracing on the top because these vessels are so tiny. And that's actually an advantage because when you don't have EKG, the arterial waveform allows you to identify the phases of cardiac cycle. So this mountain is the systole and this is the diastolic flow. And if there are any flow interruptions in any part of the cardiac cycle, you will easily know even if you don't have simultaneous EKG. And uh, with the increasing right atrial pressure, the renal venous waveform also becomes more and more pulsatile and uh, you see distinct S and D waveforms like that of hepatic vein and eventually as the RAP increases further, you just have the D wave or the diastolic wave uh, remaining. So now let's put everything together and uh, see how the grading looks like. So in general hepatic vein normal is S more than D, mildly abnormal is S lesser than D and severely abnormal is reversal of the S wave and in portal vein normal is continuous, mildly abnormal is 30 to 50 percent pulsatility and more than 50 percent pulsatility is called severely abnormal. In the intrarenal um, normal is continuous, uh, mildly abnormal is when you start to see two distinct S and D waveforms and severely abnormal is only when only D wave remains below the baseline. So you call grade zero vexus when IVC is less than 2 cm. So if the IVC is small, no further grading is required because you are not expecting to see these abnormal waveform patterns when the IVC is small. And grade 1 congestion is big IVC plus um, any of combination of normal or mildly abnormal waveforms. And if you have at least one severely abnormal pattern with big IVC, that becomes grade 2 vexus. And if you have at least two severely abnormal waveforms, uh, with a dilated IVC that becomes grade 3 congestion. So now you know how to quantify venous congestion using VEXUS. And it's not only to quantify congestion but also it allows you to uh, monitor the changes uh, with decongestive therapy. Here is a nice example where this is a patient with CHF exacerbation, uh, the IVC transverse axis you can see it's plethoric and the portal vein is 100 percent pulsatile. And with the diuretic therapy, the portal vein gradually improves and essentially normalizes by day 6, while IVC is still about 2 centimeters. It's very helpful in patients who have chronically dilated IVCs because of uh, um, severe cardiac failure or pulmonary hypertension or uh, structural tricuspid regurgitation, etc. So uh, that's it for now. Thank you so much and uh, um, follow me on Twitter at Nephropy. Thank you.